Amen, amen, amen. Okay, so we're going right to Psalm chapter 92. Ready? Psalm chapter 92. It's going to be on the screens. Here's what it says. But the godly will flourish like palm trees, and they will grow strong like the cedars of Lebanon. Look at what happens to them there. For, for they're transplanted to the Lord's own house. They flourish in the courts of our God. Even in old age, they will still produce fruit. They will remain vital and green. Now look at what's happening in this picture in the psalm. Is he's talking about trees here. And he's saying these powerful trees have been transplanted. They've been moved into the house of God. And when they got moved into the house of God, they flourished there. And they produced fruit into old age. Now, if I'm to be honest about a good interpretation of this passage, all of these blessings, the flourishing, the fruit, the, the, the lasting faith into old age, it's attached to this idea of being godly. And by godly, what I mean is someone who makes God their top priority, one who lives out the way of, G of Jesus. That's what it's talking about there, being godly. It's attached to godliness. But notice also, this godly person is someone who's planted in the house of God. Planted in the house of God. And they produce fruit. And they're blessed. And their faith doesn't run out in their 20s. Can I get an amen? amen. But into old age, they have a lasting faith, is what this passage describes. Why? Because they're planted in the house of God. You notice what it doesn't say? It doesn't say they attend church. It doesn't say that they warm a pew on a Sunday morning. It says that they're planted in the house of God. See, that's something deeper. The redwood trees in California on the coast, they are a special tree, amen? Amen. I mean, this, this, this forest, it's got all kinds of special attributes to it. But these redwood trees, if you study them, and I've been studying them this week, they are some of the tallest living organisms on planet Earth. Some of them go up past 30 stories tall. And, and here's the crazy thing. For those 300 foot tall or more trees, you know how deep their roots are? 10 feet or less. That's the shock. But even though they go down 10 feet, they grow sideways 100 feet. And they intermingle and intertwine with all the other root systems for all the other trees in that forest. In short, they hold each other up. What an incredible parable of the people of God. What an incredible parable of what the church is supposed to be when you're not attending church, but you're planted in the church. Some of us today, we're attending church. And sometimes we attend church. But are you planted? Because there's a huge difference between those two ideas, and we're going to be exploring what the Bible has to say, that, say about that all through the scripture this morning. Would you confront that idea for a second? Would you confront that idea and commit yourself to confronting that idea throughout the message this morning? Is God, am I planted? Are you planted? Now, even though in the psalm, and I'm going to get theological here for just a second. Even though in the psalm it said, be planted in the house of God, that's kind of an Old Testament concept. And some of you guys are already there mentally with me. You're like, in the Old Testament, it was about temples and it was about synagogues. And you would go to a building and the building had the presence of God in it. Do you remember that in the Old Testament? But when Jesus came, Jesus did this quite differently. Jesus didn't look for a building to be a holy place or a powerful place or a place of his presence. When Jesus came, he made the church a gathering of people, Amen. a collection of people. So in Matthew chapter 16, and we're going to read this in just a second, Jesus has a conversation with his disciples and specifically with Peter. And he says, who do you say that I am? 
And he says, who do you say that I am? Because people had different opinions about who Jesus was at that time. And Peter gets it right. He actually passes the test. He says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus said, because you said that, I'm going to call you. I'm going to rename you Rock. He called him the Rock before Dwayne Johnson ever came along. <laughs> and he says, and on this Rock, I'm going to build my church. Can we have that on the screen? Upon this Rock, I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Is that an amazing promise? Whatever might come at the church, it will not win. The church has been in existence for 2,000 years. The Roman Empire is no longer in existence. The countries that existed at the time of the birth of the church are no longer in existence. There will be a day where our country will probably no longer exist. Walmart will no longer exist. Target will no longer exist. But you know what will exist forever and ever and never be defeated? Is the church of Jesus Christ. Because that's where he attached his promise. And that word there, church, it cannot be defeated. Because Jesus put his power behind it. And that word there in the Greek is ekklesia. Do we have the slide for that? Ekklesia. Say ekklesia. You just spoke Greek this morning. Ecclesia. Ecclesia is not, when he says church, it's not a building. It's a gathering of people, or it's an assembly of called out ones. Ecclesia. So Jesus comes along and says, hey, I know people were excited about temples in the past and in the Old Testament, but where I'm going to put my spirit and where I'm going to put my promises and my power is in a gathering of believers of Jesus followers, and the family of God is going to come together. And when the family of God comes together, no matter where they are, inside or outside, whether it's 20 people or three people, that's the church. Church is happening right then and there. Does it make sense? And then in Matthew chapter 18, and I don't have this one on the screen, there's a moment, and some of you guys know it, where Jesus says, and wherever two or three are gathered in my name, he says, there am I in their midst. What an incredible promise. Jesus says, if you get together with some fellow believers, you guys have a prayer meeting, you come together in my name. He says, I'm, I'm going to come there. And I'm going to be in your midst in a powerful way. And, and, and maybe you're like, but isn't Jesus always here? Yes, he is. Jesus is omnipresent. He's present everywhere at all times. But sometimes he shows up, he manifests his presence in a powerful way that you can sense. And so Jesus is promising that here. He says, when you come together as the church, I'm going to show up. Amen. So some of you guys have been to church before. And God spoke to you. You ever have God speak to you? God convicted you. God stirred you. God did a miracle in your life in a church service as the people of God gathered together. God maybe even changed your life. All these stories are going through your mind right now. Do you know why? It wasn't because you were in a church building. It was because you were gathered with the people of God in the name of Jesus. And Jesus keeps his promises every time. He said, if you come together, I will be there in your midst. And that's why you have those kinds of stories. But, but make no mistake, he does not promise his holiness for a building. He doesn't promise his power, and he doesn't promise his presence in a building. And most of us grew up confused about that. And we get weird about this word church, right? We say, I'm going to church. I'm going to the building. I'm outside the church, and I take two steps past the threshold. Now I'm inside the church. And, and I get it, and it's weird, and I talk that way too. And I'm not trying to like pick on the way that we talk. But just understand that all the promises in the scripture that are associated with that word church, it's a group of people. Amen. And it's very important that we understand the difference that church is not a building. Also, church is not a stage. Church is not just what happens on a stage. So this is Acts chapter 2, verse 42. This is going to blow your mind a little bit. It says, all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, 
And I'm going to pause this right there real quick. This is a description, what I'm about to read to you is a description of the early first century church and the way that they did church together. This is right after the resurrection of Jesus. And they, by this point, they are a mega church. They are thousands and thousands of people, Christians in Jerusalem. And they're meeting together. And this is going to describe to us exactly what they did together. But notice first that they are devoted to the apostles' teaching. Devoted. That word should, that should, that word should indicate to you redwoods. Being planted. They're all in. They're committed. What else about them? To the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. And then verse 44, and all the believers met together in one place and shared everything that they had. And they sold their property and possessions and they shared the money with those in need. And they worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. How would you like to go to a church like that? Some of you are like, my schedule wouldn't allow that. <laughs> right? But wouldn't it be amazing to be in a community of people that vibrant? Yes. That's going hard after God at that level. And not only are they going hard after Jesus, but they're also supporting each other at the level that that describes. That's amazing. Notice also, it gives us two different places where they were. Did you notice that? They're in the temple and they're in homes. Now, why is that important? First off, they could listen to the apostles' teaching in the temple, scholars tell us, historians tell us that there were places in the temple at that time, the temple construct, where you could go and the acoustics were right to where thousands of people could hear a single teacher give a message. And so the early church, they would go there together. There was a place called Solomon's Colonnade. And they would go and they would listen to the apostles give a weekly sermon for real. Also, they would meet in homes. Now, why is that important? Because there's some things that you can't do on the large scale, right? And so you've got to get down to 10 people or 15 people or 20 people at the most if you're a wealthier person with a larger house. And that's where you're going to take the Lord's Supper together. And that's where you're going to share. And that's where you're going to have meals. And that's where you're actually going to get to know each other and pray for each other's prayer requests. Because you're not praying for each other's prayer requests in the seats on Sunday mornings, are you? Of course you're not. You might have family members sat around you, but look to the right and the left and front and behind real quick. Just look around. You don't know these people, right? You might know a few of them, but you don't know what their deepest needs are this week. Why? Because Rose don't know. The people that we're sitting next to on a Sunday morning, we don't know them all that well. We need to get to know them better. But that's part of what they did in the New Testament so that they could break things down and do actual relationship with each other and get to know each other. Because Rose don't know. Pastor Ricky actually is going to speak next week on getting into a life group. Because Sunday morning isn't enough. And you need deep friendship. And you need to actually go there with people. Look, I've got a list for you. This is a list of all the things that they did in that passage that we just read. So I'll take you down through it. Number one, they listened to the apostles' teaching. They worshiped the Lord together, it said. They fellowshiped, which meant they connected with each other. They actually went there. They actually became a spiritual community and a family. They talked. They shared meals together. They helped each other with needs, and they prayed for each other. Now, out of those six things, which of those things happened on a stage? Just the first two. The other four? The other four don't happen on a stage. They happen when the people of God gather. And for us in our context, even on a Sunday morning, most of that other stuff happens between the services. Or it happens before the service or after the service. Or if you get into a life group, it's going to start happening more and more deeply there but it's not on a stage, and that's important. I'm going to prove it to you again. Look at Hebrews chapter 10. 
Verse 24, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now, that's a powerful verse. A couple things. First off, notice that they were inclined to stop meeting together. They had started to get out of the habit. They had started to get too busy. And this is 2,000 years before COVID, amen? 2,000 years before COVID, the early church is tempted to not go to church. They're tempted to not be together. And what's getting in the way for them? Well, it's all the same stuff that gets in the way for us. But doesn't it encourage you just a little bit that they were tempted in the first century the same way that we're tempted today to isolate and to not follow through maybe on what we know is good for us sometimes? Because, man, I just let's just be real. God can tell us the incredible blessings and treasures that are here in the church, but sometimes we just don't choose the things that are best for us, right? And they were doing it. That encourages me. The other thing that I see that I think is so powerful here is notice why they needed to be together. They needed to be together not because of what happens on a stage. There's actually no mention of a stage in that verse, there's no mention of a stage. There's no mention of teaching. There's no mention of singing. Everything is about encourage each other. There's not even a mention of a pastor in that verse, which I'm personally offended by. <laughs> but it doesn't say you ought to meet together so that you can all talk to a pastor or be in a building or watch a service that's supposed to happen on a stage. Let that confront you for just a second. See, what the New Testament expects is that the, the ecclesia of Jesus, the gathering of his people, that we come together and that we encourage each other and that we spur each other on toward greater and greater love, each other. And when does that happen? For a lot of us, I do think that it happens in between the services. And when we get here early, and when we stick around a little bit late before we bolt to our car, amen? Okay, let's, let's summarize a few things. And when I say I'm going to summarize a few things, I'm not hinting to you that I'm anywhere near the end, because I'm not, <laughs> not at all. But I just want to summarize what we've said so far. Number one, do pastors want you to attend church? Yes and no. Yes, but no. I want you to be planted. It's not about you warming a seat on a Sunday morning. It's really not. It's not about attendance numbers. It's not about church size. It's about you getting all the treasure that God has planned for you. I want you to have it. And so get planted. Be a redwood. Next, is church a building? No. Church is a gathering of Jesus' followers. We're supposed to be a group of redwood trees. Next, is church just what happens on a stage? No, teaching and worship happens on a stage. But all the other stuff happens when the people of God come together and we encourage each other and we serve and we talk and we pray. You know, right before the service, Jim and Janet Calloway pulled me aside while the singing was happening and they prayed for my throat. That's life-giving. I love, I love knowing that somebody cares about me enough to pull me aside and to bring the power of God to bear and to expect a miracle out of him right before the service starts. See how individual this can be as a church community? This is what it's supposed to be. A lot of this stuff it happens in five minutes in our cramped lobby out there, our terribly cramped lobby with our awful bathrooms that there's not enough spaces for all of us. But in the midst of all of that, after you leave the service today, you can connect with other people and have conversations. And just follow me for a second. And as you get to know each other, as you start to share life, 
Will a lot of those conversations, I don't know, will they not really go there? Of course. But some of those conversations will go there today. Some of them, you're going to share real life. You're going to memorize each other's names. You're going to start to get to know each other. You're going to start to get to know each other's kids. You're going to start to ask each other what your prayer requests are. Because this is what the people of God are supposed to do. What kind of a week did you have? Talk to me about it. Tell me about it. We've got time. I'm not going to bolt to my car. Can I get an amen? Amen. Because there's magic there, guys. You got the services, and you got the middle, and there's magic in the middle. Say there's magic in the middle. There is. You got the margins around the service, and there's miracles in those margins. And we miss the miracles that are in those margins because sometimes we're just coming for what happens on a stage. Yes? Jesus has more for us. So much more. Some of you need to be serving on a team. Getting into a life group. Serving in kids ministry. Brewing coffee. Jumping onto the parking team. Being a greeter. Being on the tech team. Why do you need to do those things? Because what you're going to do is you're going to start to shrink the scale down here at church. And it's not going to be, I don't know, 150 people in a room. It's going to be the 10 people that you're serving alongside of. They're going to get to know your name really well. They're going to start to get to know you. And guess what? When you miss church, who's going to miss you? That team is. What you're doing is you're allowing yourself to be known and to be connected. Do you see the roots going out? You're allowing yourself to be connected. Practically speaking, these are the things that the people of God need to do on a Sunday. And it might sound small to you, but it's massive. And Jesus gave the Great Commission. Some of you guys know that in Matthew 28. He said, go into all the world. Do you remember the words? Go into all the world and preach the gospel. And baptize them, he said, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach them... To obey all the things that I've told you. Do you remember Jesus saying that? Do you know what he didn't do? He didn't speak it to pastors. He spoke it to the people of God. The great commission has been given to you. It's Jesus' version of paying it forward. This is the grace of God and the gospel. The amazing gospel was given to you. And it's changed your life. And you should feel a personal responsibility as a Christian today to give it to somebody else across your whole life. Not only just to your kids and to your grandkids, but to other people that God wants to bring into your life. And do you know where you get started on the Great Commission? On Sundays. You get started. You start taking some baby steps here at church. It's not the only place where you fulfill the Great Commission, but it's where you start. It's like an incubator. Do you know what an incubator is? Or a greenhouse? It's you take the little baby things that can't quite get strong on their own yet. You need some baby steps for them. They take some baby steps there. That's what church is on a Sunday morning, is you get to serve for the first time. You get to get outside of yourself. You get to figure out what the Holy Spirit gave you as unique, powerful, spiritual gifts in your life because those gifts are part of God's identity for you. He uniquely designed you a particular way. And you're not only getting to know people, but you're actually getting to flourish in your gifts and fulfill the mission that Jesus gave to the church. There's a lot of magic in the middle, isn't there? (laughs) There's a lot that he wants us doing on a Sunday morning as the ecclesia of Jesus as we come together. Because this is where he promised his presence would be. This is where he promised his power would be and his holiness. Jesus said, I will be there. So what about online church? Here's a question. Hey, you online folks, I see you. Love that you're with us today. Online church. Praise God for online church. Praise God for the blessing of online church. 
Praise God that it is available 24-7 for anybody who needs it whenever they need it. Amen? No matter where they are. We got soldiers out on deployment. We got families who PCS to their next duty station. And they don't have a new church quite yet. And so they're still connected with us. Love you guys. I read all the comments in the chat on Monday mornings and just see who's still out there and who's, who's connecting in. And it's a beautiful thing and it's wonderful. And you guys are depending on each other and you're bringing the church into it. And I love all of that. Also, for somebody who's got a medical issue, it's an amazing thing that it's available. Somebody who's got a bad work schedule and they can't get here on a weekend, it's an amazing thing for them. Here's just what I would say to you. It is more of a place to be online church. I would not see it as a permanent destination. Not as a permanent destination. And the reason I say that is because it's hard to be connected to the ecclesia of Jesus Christ online. Because there's a lot of extra focus on what happens on this stage and presenting this stage to you guys online. And I just don't think it's all that Jesus has. I just think there's more. And I want you to have all that he's got for you. You need the family of God. I also want to say something small um, to those of you who are, um, you're getting these messages that we present on Sundays and you're listening to them online later on throughout the week. Our intention here at Grace Fellowship Church is that these would be a great blessing to you and to your spiritual growth, but they are not a substitute for your own local church. So if you're out of state or you're in a different location, you've not found a local church yet, I want you to find a local church because he's got so much for you in being part of a local church yourself. So don't let us be a replacement for that. Practical. What's your next step? Practical. What's God calling to you next? It, it, it's not a question of how do I get perfect about the ecclesia? How do I get perfect about my church involvement right away? I, I'm not looking at that. But how do you go deeper? How do you start getting planted in a way that you've never been planted before? I'll just ask you that. Would you confront it? Maybe you're attending periodically and maybe your periodic attendance needs to get more often. Can I just say that? Because it's the way that human relationships work. If you only see people a certain number of times, we all just know it. You're just not going to go that deep with each other. You just have to be around each other more often. Can I get an amen? amen? Yeah. So you might need to increase that. For some of you, um, maybe your commitment, your next commitment needs to be that I'm not going to be in ninja mode on Sundays. I'm not going to sneak in right before the service and sneak right back out and bolt to my car. But maybe it's a simple commitment of like, you know what? I'm going to give it 25 minutes and I'm going to connect in with the body of Christ before I leave. And I'm going to be a blessing to somebody and I'm going to minister to somebody and pray for somebody. Does that make sense? Maybe consider that. Maybe another step for you to consider is maybe I'm going to attend one service and then I'm going to serve a service. Maybe I'm going to serve on the parking lot team for a second service. Or maybe I'm going to go and serve in the kids' ministry or as an usher. Or one of the many things that you can do. I'm just going to, I'm just going to give Sunday morning a bit more time than I've given it in the past. Figure out what my gifts are. And then if you're online, maybe God's calling you to be around some people. Consider that. Moms and dads. Grandmas and grandpas. Could I challenge you for a second? Is your greatest desire for your kids and grandkids that they would get to know Jesus? Is your greatest desire that they would learn what the gospel means? Learn the Bible stories the way that you learned the Bible stories so that the scripture would start to come, to, come alive to you at a young age? If that's your greatest desire for your kids, and I pray that it is, how often should you be bringing them to church? Just being practical. Who else is teaching them the way of Jesus? Except on Sundays. And for many of us, 
if you think about your own past and the way that you grew up in the church, it wasn't necessarily the Sunday school lessons that lit the fire of faith in your soul. It was the fact that you saw passion and love in a teacher. You got to know somebody growing up and you caught faith from them more than the faith was taught to you. Some of you can think of that teacher right now. And you know the love that they had for you. You know the way that they treated you. And you knew it was real inside of that person. And that was compelling to you as you were growing up. Where else are your kids getting that throughout the week? Why wouldn't you have them here every single time these church doors are open? Know what I mean? Just a question. A few months ago, Pastor Ricky was up here preaching, and I went and saw Ashley in the preschool area and said, put me in a room, because sometimes I like doing that. And she put me in the three-year-old room, of course. <laughs> and I'm sitting in there, and thank God there was another teacher that actually knew what she was doing. And she kind of led me along the whole time. And uh, I mean, we had a great time with these kids, right? But at one point, I remember in the service, I was sitting down with the kids, and I think it was goldfish time. And she handed me this little book, and it was for prayer requests. And it was just like, I don't know, it was just all these papers with a little cover on it. And she gave, gave me this little, like, golf pencil. And she said, okay, Josh, sit down and ask the kids what their prayer requests are. And I didn't realize when she first set me to that task what the power was going to be in that little pencil and paper, but there was power there. Because all of a sudden I sat down and I'm ready to write and I'm asking a three-year-old, what do you want from Jesus this week? And when an adult is sitting there ready to write down their words, do you know what that does to a three-year-old? They realize they're being listened to. They realize that this is serious. You're going to write down my words. And I wrote down what they said. And, and as we went around the room and I heard what all those kids wanted Jesus to do for them that week, it would blow your mind what I heard that morning. Stuff about family struggles and mom and dad struggles. And there's always a brother, by the way. There's always, <laughs> always a brother who's a pain. And I'm writing all of this stuff down. Who's asking your kids this week what they want Jesus to do in their life? If it's not happening at church, where is it happening? And I think you want that for them. Amen? Amen. All right. A couple of final things. I just want to call out some people that I'm so thankful for here. I mentioned Jim and Janet and the way that they seek God in prayer before the services even start on a Sunday morning. And Carrie Cochrane, who leads our prayer team, and Dodie Hoffman, who sits in the back corner during first service because she walks this room and she prays over this room before the services even start. Did you know someone was doing that? Just praying over this space because that's what happens. Um, we got a lady named Brittany, and she serves in our kids' ministry, and she knows that we've got a hard-of-hearing child in the preschool, and so she's learning sign language so that she can reach out during the lessons to this hard of hearing child that's coming on Sundays. Did you know that? That's the ecclesia of Jesus in action. Amen. People doing what they're supposed to do. Praise God for that. I love Matt France and the whole parking team. Do you, do you see those guys with the blue hands? This morning before the sun started to come out just a little bit, they were outside in the dark and cold putting those flags up. And wearing those blue hands, Nick, you were out there. I saw you. Loving on God's people, rolling out the welcome mat to all of us. Taking part in the kingdom of God, not just to push the mission forward, but to be together. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Amen. And Bill and Chastity and Donald and Jade and Mike and Stacy and just all of those guys. And the men's ministry guys who kind of like stalk the, the lobby a little bit on Sundays, if you've seen them in their t-shirts. And if they think that you're a guy who's not plugged into community yet, they will pull you into the men's group for Saturday mornings. 
there's a heart there, amen? And I love that. And Mac Hutton, and he'll, he'll give you a bear hug as a greeter, and he'll memorize your name if he can. And there's Carolina, who's on the brew crew, and she makes sure that there's always plenty of coffee. Last story. There was a woman a little while back, and she came here. And I got to talk to her after a service, and I think her story is compelling for us just to finish on. And she told me after the service, she said, she said, I've been church hurt, and there was a crisis in a church, and I walked away from God, and I walked away from the church for a while. And she said, today, Pastor, I'm, I'm back for the first time. And she said, but what's weird is, she said, because I've been gone so long, I didn't expect God would speak to me. You ever felt like that? Have you ever felt like you've walked away from God so much that you ought to be in the penalty box for a while? And her shock was, she's like, I walked in this morning and he just spoke to me. Why? Because when the father's on the porch and the prodigal comes walking up the road, what's the father do? He runs for us. He runs for us. All of us, every single time. And this whole series, we're talking about all these things that we should be doing, right? Like Bible reading and praying and going to church and worshiping and all this kind of stuff. And, and, and the risk we've been talking about each week, the risk is that you guys will get so hung up in your brains about these are all the things that I ought to do. And I should really feel guilty that I don't do these things more. And can I just say on behalf of that woman and on behalf of me, stop it. Stop the guilt. Jesus did not die for your sins so that you would be perpetually guilty. Amen. He wants you to swim in the ocean of his grace. Amen. He wants you to enjoy the blessing that he has for you. He wants you free so that you can worship him. All the treasure that he has for you. That's what coming to church is about. Being planted. It's about the treasure that he has for you. Amen? Amen. Why don't you guys stand? <clears throat> With your eyes closed, I would just ask you, was the Lord speaking during that message about a step forward that you need to take in being planted. Not just attending, but being planted. And if God was speaking to you, could you believe today that he's going to give you the power to walk forward in that obedience? Because that's the kind of God he is. So right now, as I pray, would you just commit to him? God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to obey you. I'm going to take this step. Some of you are having an experience right now of the living God. And you're reaching out to him. And you've missed him. And it's sweet. Thank you, Lord, for visiting us today. You're so good. We worship you. In Christ's name.